Hello, I'm Dr. Ricky Aronson. I'm a geriatrician and endocrinologist. I'm the head of department of a large public hospital geriatric department uh, in Perth. I thought it might be useful to uh, update the public and give a comprehensive and concise summary on what's going on with coronavirus. And I hope to cover what's different about it. What should we be doing better to survive? What can you do? And also discuss some of the myths and controversies like should we be closing all the schools now? Firstly, I'd like to emphasize that it's extremely important to understand that most of us will survive this pandemic. Life will go on. Most people will still be alive at the end of this and society will continue and thrive and rebound. However, this is an unprecedented event in our lifetime. No one has witnessed anything like this in the medical profession or the general public. And there is a large risk that this will endure for at least the next six to 18 months with a hope that we will reach some kind of peak in the next three to six months. Thousands will, will die during this pandemic and we will emerge into a different world economically. The economic fallout of this will last for at least one or two years. But if we do things right, we can limit mortality from coronavirus to about 0.5 to 1% based on current world statistics. It is true that the elderly are at the highest risk of coronavirus. However, it is important also to be aware that younger people do get sick. So what we have seen around the world is around a 0% mortality risk in the 0 to 20 age group, about a 0.5% risk in the 40 to 50 year old age group, climbing to around 5 to 10% in people older than 70. So I guess the lesson from that is we must take care of elderly people. And also we are seeing younger people in their 30s to 50s in intensive care units around the world. Now the first myth I'd like to dispel is that coronavirus is some kind of media hype or just a regular influenza virus. Nothing could be further from the truth. When this novel virus emerged in China, very few people stood up and took notice. We thought that it was just another virus and that we, would be, that we would be able to contain it like we did SARS and H1N1 swine flu. Many people thought that this was a Chinese problem. It wasn't until we witnessed the total disaster in Italy that we started to realize that this was coming for all of us and it was nothing like the influenza virus. Italy has now reached around 6,000 deaths and they've been experiencing 400 to 500 deaths per day on a number of days over the last week. They have 64,000 cases. From this, we've come to understand a number of important implications for our society. Firstly, that coronavirus is much more deadly than influenza. Secondly, that our medical systems were very unprepared for what was coming. Thirdly, that Western democracies have acted far too slowly to respond to this crisis and there seems, to be, there seems to have been a philosophy of waiting to see the white of the eyes of the lion before we run away. We took far too long to close our borders. One of the other problems has been both the government and the public around the world in Western democracies have been reluctant and slow to make decisions that were uncomfortable for all of us. However, there have been major lessons from Italy which we can learn and which are being put in place in Australia. Firstly, we have learned that if the infection spreads too rapidly in the public, it overwhelms the health system and that results in many unnecessary and preventable deaths. So about one sixth of people who develop coronavirus require medical attention of some sort and about 5% um, require intensive care admission. With thousands and thousands of patients infected rapidly, this overwhelms any health system and there has been a situation in Italy where patients over 70 have been unable to access ventilated and allowed to die. This is obviously something that we would avoid at all costs everywhere else in the world. These problems have been compounded by the fact that health workers and doctors are working at the front lines and they themselves become ill and this further reduces the number of doctors and healthcare workers available to care for the sick. With our understanding of what's happened in Italy, we have shifted our focus to um, slowing the curve, which basically means that we are trying to slow the spread of coronavirus through society to enable our health system to cope with the numbers of patients 
presenting to hospital and requiring intensive care. And that will significantly reduce mortality. The evidence that we see is that we should be able to, to keep mortality rates around uh, less than 1% if we can deliver adequate health care to those in need. Now the other thing that we've learned is that if we are able to slow the onset of infection, slow the curve, the peak of infection is actually lower. So there will be fewer cases of coronavirus. Now I think most people that I've spoken to initially and still many people now have the idea that this is all about me or all about you and it really isn't. It's a populational issue. The way most responsible doctors and healthcare workers and the government is thinking about this now is about protecting the population as a whole. We accept that many of us will get coronavirus, most of us will survive, but we can save many lives by, by slowing the spread of the virus. I want to make the important point that there is no such thing as a partial quarantine. Um, you only take, it only takes one contact to pass on coronavirus to you. Now, an important thing to understand is what is different about coronavirus to influenza? What's different about this virus to everything that's happened before? Well, firstly, we don't have immunity to it because it's a new virus that our immune systems have not uh, um, encountered before. So that results in rapid spread of infection and vulnerability to infection. The second thing that has been apparent is that the virus is much more hardy than many other viruses. It survives on surfaces for a long time, which also enables more rapid uh, spread of the virus and makes it more difficult to contain. As mentioned, there's a much higher rate of hospitalis hospitalization and death compared to um, other viruses. And I guess one of the other challenges we've faced is that patients often are either asymptomatic throughout the illness or develop quite mild upper respiratory tract infections, particularly manifesting with dry cough, sometimes fever, and sometimes typical cold symptoms. And th this means that it's much more difficult to identify people who have the virus. It is quite possible that anyone around you right now who's perfectly well may already be infective, and that's a challenge for containment. So what can we do to save lives? Well, one of the best strategies in life is to look at um, winners and look at who has emerged with uh, some kind of good result from coronavirus. And in this, I talk about countries like Taiwan, South Korea, Hong Kong, and China, who actually managed to contain the virus quite well after the initial events unfolded. So what have the effective strategies been? Well, one of the major focuses of effective strategies is rigorous testing and isolation of all uh, members of the public who have the virus and careful contact tracing. And the other effective mechanism has been social distancing and restriction of social contact uh, through government policy. So what can we do as individuals? What can the public do? Well, I think everyone's aware that hand hygiene is very important. However, it isn't necessary to run around everywhere with alcohol gel because warm water and soap disrupt, warm water and soap disrupt viral membranes and in fact just careful hand washing is an effective technique. Obviously don't cough and sneeze on other people and try to avoid touching your mouth and nose if that's possible because that's actually very difficult to achieve. However, the most important uh, measure is social distancing. So first of all, since it is difficult to trace every single coronavirus contact in society, if you do develop upper respiratory tract symptoms, a dry cough, you feel unwell, please stay home and avoid contact as much as possible with your family and other people within what's realistic. Now, with social distancing, it is very important to understand you can get this disease from breathing other people's air, from breathing in respiratory droplets, so please stay at least 1.5 meters away from other people as much as possible. And a major focus will be avoiding all non-essential social contact. If you're able to work from home, please do so. The thousands of people queuing up in Costco's and Coles and Woolworths to buy toilet paper have this all wrong. That's the easiest way to spread coronavirus. And, uh, and although I'm very uh, particular about toilet hygiene, toilet paper will not save any lives in this coronavirus epidemic. Um, and I'll, I'll just one other public health tip, please don't flush baby wipes because that causes major uh, sanitation issues um, with, with uh, blockage of sewers. Now, 
One of the problems that we've seen is crowds on Bondi Beach. Everywhere I drive at the moment, I see people queuing up in coffee shops. This is not social distancing. Social distancing is, cannot be selective. This is a, a very unusual situation in history where the enemy, enemy lies within. The person carrying coronavirus could be your friend, it could be your brother, it could be your son. It only takes a crowd of two people for one to transmit coronavirus to the other. People should not be out queuing together for coffee, even if for takeaways. Any non-essential contact between human beings must cease immediately to stop spread of the virus. Um, unfortunately, uh, there is no convenient quarantining. If you're quarantined at home and other people are coming into your house, be they your friends or relatives, they could bring coronavirus into your home. Understand that this is a life and death issue. Even if you are in your 30s or 40s or 50s, your risk of dying of coronavirus is low, but it is still a possibility. And certainly, you could be a vector to infect your close relatives and cause the death of your parents or grandparents. So please take this very seriously. Um, I think that one of the other um, issues that we have is there will need to be some kind of better guidance about how people should do grocery shopping. If you're able to wear a mask, please do so. Uh, conduct good hand hygiene. And also, we will need to limit um, the, or, or ensure that people keep safe distances in shops and, and a good distance from each other. Now, coming to the issue of closing schools and other government restrictions, there appear from recent history, or there appears to be two routes to lockdown and restrictions from the government. There's a controlled lockdown, as, as we've seen in some countries in the Far East. These lockdowns tend to be quite effective. People can plan for them. And people are very innovative and creative in how they continue to run their businesses, teach online, um, and find ways to continue working effectively and surviving. But this requires public cooperation. Where there is inadequate public cooperation and people are still going to shopping centers and beaches and coffee shops, unfortunately what we've seen is that lockdowns happen by, uh, by severe restriction from the government and that's happened in places like Italy and United Kingdom and sometimes the army has to be called in and this is already at a point where disaster and catastrophe has occurred. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about closing schools, which is a very complex issue. We are in a situation with coronavirus that vaccinations and treatments are still a distance away. There is some experimental work with treatments which may or may not prove effective. And there are vaccinations that are actually well in advance towards development, but we are looking at many months before these vaccinations are available to the general market. And it's not unreasonable to anticipate that coronavirus may be with us for the next six to 18 months at least. Everyone needs to understand that the result of this is catastrophic for the economy and for people. People, hardworking industrious Australians have lost their jobs and will be unemployed for a long period. Poverty is actually a cause of illness and death. And we need to understand as well that other illnesses still continue to exist in the world and need medical care. We still need doctors and nurses and healthcare workers looking after people who have other diseases. And the, the economic cost of this um, virus is going to be immense. We cannot afford to shut down productivity completely for six to 12 months. So the government has to act responsibly so that people don't die of poverty and lack of productivity and no food. So, what I would ask of people is if you are vocal critics of the government and you are calling for schools to be closed, understand that half measures with quarantine don't work. If you really take things that seriously, you need to shut yourself alone in your house for the next six to 12 months, because once you're having contact with relatives who are going shopping and going out the house, you have potential coronavirus vectors. The second issue is that children don't actually get coronavirus seriously, so there's been one death around the world in an under 20 year old, and children appear to be infected far less than, than other people, so approximately 10% uh, of the uh, rate of infection in adults from, from South, Korean, South Korean data. The other public health message I deliver is that one way to save lives is to ensure that our hospitals are able to deliver adequate resource to those in need. So please don't go to emergency departments with non-emergencies. Stay away and understand as well that emergency departments are going to be full of coronavirus. You're much safer staying away from an emergency department 
for your own good. Now, there is diversity of opinion about how fast the government should act, but understand that the government and public health authorities have been working day and night trying to prepare for coronavirus, while many other people have been walking around complaining and posting, posting social media messages. I myself have worked for at least 20 hours over the last two days um, to uh, try to prepare my hospital for coronavirus. We're doing all we can to ensure that more Australians survive and recover from this. Crises bring out the best and worst in humanity. So you can either sign up with the Doomsday Brigade and declare that the world's about to end, or you can get busy trying to save it. This is your big moment to make a difference. Take care of the elderly, deliver them groceries, isolate them, practice consistent good social distancing and hand hygiene. Take care of your hospitals by not going to emergency departments with non-emergencies and please take care of yourself. Thank you.